It was a typical evening at the KMBC office where David Horowitz was live on air alongside two other anchors. As he was ready to present the evening news, an unexpected turn of events unfolded before his eyes. On August 19, 1987 during the 4 p.m. edition of NBC's Channel 4 News, a harrowing incident shook the Burbank studios as a man armed with a gun, Gary Stolman, gained access to the live news report as a guest of an employee. What is this? Let me see what it says. All right. He's got a gun to his back. All right, well, let me read this. Folks, we have we have someone on the set who's standing here and would like me to read um, to read this uh, this this copy which was just handed to me. You want to tell me your name or not? What is it? And Gary, where are you from? Despite the palpable tension, David Horowitz remained composed, a testament to his professionalism, as he reluctantly complied with the intruder's demands, reading them aloud for the audience. However, unbeknownst to Gary Stolman, the news feed had been discreetly taken off the air, a strategic maneuver executed by the studio crew to mitigate the risk of further chaos. And Gary, where are you from? At that point, the control room was ordered to go to black, kill the studio mics, and put up a standby slide. But Horowitz continued to read, and the gunman kept the gun in his back. I was warned in 1981 by someone with connections at the CIA to stay off the computers that they didn't trust people on computers. When I began receiving disturbing calls from my parents, which led me to believe that something terrible was going on, I was then forced into a mental hospital in Tallahassee where I learned that my brother-in-law had been driven insane in the, in the same, what is it? in the same manner that someone was trying to do to me. The firearm turned out to be an exact replica of a real gun, adding a chilling layer of deception to the unfolding crisis. With law enforcement now on the scene, poised to take action, Gary's sudden decision to place the gun on the table after his statement was read, marked a critical juncture. In a swift and coordinated maneuver, the police swiftly tackled him to the ground, bringing an end to the tense standoff. The gunman, later identified as Gary Stolman, emerged as an unexpected figure within the studio, revealing a startling connection to KNBC's pharmacist, Max Stolman, his own father. Max Stolman, in the aftermath of the incident, bravely came forward, acknowledging his son's prolonged battle with illness. Despite the gravity of the situation, he expressed profound gratitude that his son emerged unharmed from the ordeal. It was a typical Saturday evening at the Bradford Stadium, where a match between Bradford City and Lincoln City was taking place. The final game of that season had started in a celebratory atmosphere with the home team receiving the third division championship trophy. The Bradford City Stadium itself was known for its antiquated design and facilities, which included the wooden roof of the main stand. Previous warnings had also been given about a major buildup of litter in the cavity below the seats in the stand. The stand had been officially condemned and was due to be replaced with a steel structure after the season ended. However, on that specific day, it was already far too late. We've actually got a fire in the stand on the far side of the ground. And that looks very nasty indeed. Now the police have gone over there to try and quell uh, the fire and they're frantically getting some of the supporters out. Now these are extraordinary scenes at Valley Parade. It's supposed to be a day of celebration. One hopes the stand doesn't burn down. At 3.44 p.m., just five minutes before halftime, the first ominous sign of the impending disaster emerged. A faint glowing light observed three rows from the back of Block G, as recounted by television commentator John Helm. Reflecting on the incident in an interview with the Express newspaper, Helm provided a chilling narrative. A man visiting from Australia, attending the game with his son, unwittingly sparked the tragedy. After lighting a cigarette, he attempted to extinguish it by placing it on the floorboard. However, the cigarette slipped through a gap in the floor, prompting the man and his son to pour coffee on the emerging smoke, believing they had contained the situation. Yet, within moments, a sudden surge of smoke engulfed the area. Hastening to seek assistance from a steward, they returned to find that the situation had escalated beyond control. 
and the two and a half thousand people in that stand are panicking. They are frantic to get out. And these are disastrous scenes for the club. One can feel the heat. As the fire rapidly spread, the wooden stands and roof, layered with highly flammable bituminous roofing, became engulfed in flames. Burning timbers and molten materials cascaded from the roof, raining down upon the crowd and seating below. Meanwhile, dense black smoke billowed, shrouding a passageway behind the stand where numerous spectators sought escape. Amidst the chaos, spectators desperate to flee began pouring over the wall separating the stand from the pitch. Alerted by the linesmen on that side of the field, referee Norman Glover halted the game with just three minutes remaining before halftime. In a terrifyingly swift turn of events, less than four minutes sufficed for the entire stand to be consumed by the voracious flames. Now becoming tremendous. I'm sitting immediately opposite the main stand and I can feel the heat. It's almost beginning to burn me over here, quite honestly. The whole stand is going to have gone in the space of a few minutes. Quite extraordinary scenes at Valley Parade. This was supposed to be a day of utter joy, triumph and celebration. It's turning it into a nightmare. There is a policeman on... Given the escalating severity of the situation in the stadium, it's evident that conditions were rapidly deteriorating. With the flames spiraling out of control and exits overwhelmed by panicked crowds, many found themselves trapped in the inferno. In the upcoming audio clip, you'll hear first-hand accounts from commentators who were present at the stadium during the tragedy. Please be aware that the intensity of their commentary and the distressing nature of the content may evoke strong emotions. As such, it's crucial to approach this audio clip with caution, especially if you're sensitive to distressing content. Viewer discretion is advised. And we're on fire here at Valley Parade. The whole end of the stand at one side is actually in flames. Now I can see the orange of the flames. The game is actually stopped here at Valley Parade. Before that, there was a certain amount of shaking of fists and a bit of a hoo-ha at that far end. And they're running out of the ground now from that far end at this moment. And I'm hoping that the police, I can see some policemen's helmets over there, can control this. It looks like there could be a situation of panic that all the time people are spilling under the pitch and we can see the flames going up into the air there. We're getting reports outside that that steam is going over and people are running around they're running around beside us they're running around all around us and people are saying get onto that pitch people all the time spilling onto the pitch the game is stopped Mickey Bullock you, you can see above oh, me what can you say the whole stand is on fire Tony it's an absolute it's spreading quickly there's going to be there's going to be problems Tony let's get all those people out of there let's get those people just take your time don't rush go down there take your time going down there don't pull on the wires keep the electrics over there keep them take their time don't rush don't push wait for the kiddies People are coming around us, you can hear the heat, the smoke coming everywhere. We are going to have to disconnect very shortly, because it really is flaming all the time. We're taking a break, we're getting out of it. In the aftermath of this harrowing ordeal, the toll was staggering. 56 lives lost and 265 individuals left injured, their lives forever altered by the tragic events. Some of those who died were found still seated, covered by pieces of tarpaulin that had fallen from the roof. The police worked tirelessly until 4 a.m. the next morning, using bright lights to remove all the bodies. Within a few hours of the fire starting, it became clear that many of those who died succumbed to smoke inhalation, while some held on until they reached the hospital. Thank you for watching. I have a straightforward request. Creating videos like this one requires a significant amount of time and effort. If you enjoyed this video and would like to see more like it in the future, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Please leave a comment below, share this video with your friends, give it a big thumbs up, and don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Your support means the world to me and helps me continue making content you enjoy.